Line up sheets for small groups there. Um, look at those, see if any of those fit into your week. Uh, a couple of community things. Uh, the Eaton girls won state for softball yesterday. Yeah, so congratulations, I guess after 22 years, I think. So really big accomplishment. And then Friday night we had our first high school game out there at Eaton, and, and Eaton just, they, they dominated. And I was out there with uh, Kurt and Melissa, and we were watching, and uh, there was this red streak down the sideline. I thought, man, that guy burned. No one was close. And Kurt looked at me and goes, Oh, that's Ethan Flores from church. So congratulations. Uh, very fast. Very fast. So for a touchdown as well. It was really, really great time. So good times this week out there in Eaton. But we're glad to have you all here this morning to uh, worship with us. But I will take a pause for a moment. I'd like to invite John Bonus to the podium for an announcement. I know they wouldn't like this, but can we give it a hand just around for the work Pastor Dave and Patty have been doing? Over this last year, we certainly do appreciate his work for the Lord here in our church. So it's a real blessing. If you'll rise with me so we can do this month's memory verse together. And if you'll repeat after me, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Perfect. One more time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If you remain standing as we open God's word today in Psalm 119, 97 through 104. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. This is the reading of God's inerrant and holy word. Let us pray over today's service. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we are thankful today that you are such a righteous and good God. You are faithful. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you for the enormous privilege you have given us to be called a child of God. So, Father, let us rejoice that you are our wonderful Savior. Father, hear our prayers, hear our singing, hear our hearts to you today. Father, let it be you high and lifted up. Father, let us see you on your glorious throne here today in our worship. Father, be with Pastor Dave as he brings the word, the word he has prepared diligently for us to hear Father, let it be your words through him for us. Father, today, we also thank you for that prayer your son taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let me just take a moment to uh, respond to John's kind representation of you this morning. We are so appreciative, Patty and I, can 
tell you, it's a hard day. I, you know, you know that. Uh, it's hard because, number one, um, we know that there are others who deserve whatever you give us just as much, and, uh, and yet uh, we get the recognition. It's part of the job, I guess, but uh, we, we are appreciative and yet realize that there are many people behind the scenes doing many things that we appreciate. And the second is, we know we don't really deserve it. Uh, it's all glory to God for anything good. Every pastor's in that same boat. If things go wrong, it's your fault. If they go right, it's God's fault. And that's a true statement. So uh, we praise God for the things that he does. Well, we're reading this morning from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Children. Now, this is first grade and under, so some of the rest of you hold your place, Okay. You may be dismissed to Carla. All right, thank you. I'll get that down after, you know, about the time we're back to summer and not doing it anymore. <laughs> All right, First Timothy chapter uh, 4, and um, reading verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. This is our word from God this morning. Let's pray as we look into the word. Father, we thank you for the blessings of your word. We thank you for the truth that is there, truth to live by. Pray that you will help us, in fact, to do that, not just learn truth, but live by it, and uh, that in all the places, Bible studies, Sunday school classes, whatever, where we can learn more about you, that we will put it into practice. That's our, that's our goal and that's our prayer, that we might be more like you. Help us today through this passage to learn what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 4 if you're not already there. Just a quick outline of 1 Timothy 4 to start this. Timothy, this is Paul writing to Timothy, the young pastor who's struggling a little bit in Ephesus where Paul has sent him to be the pastor as there are other elders there as well, but Timothy is the teaching pastor there. And Paul has some words of advice for him. By the time he gets to chapter four, he is telling him, listen, Timothy, here's what you expect in the first five verses. Expect the apostasy. There will be those who fall away to false teachers, false prophets. In fact, some of those are gonna come from within your own church. Then in verses 6 through 16, he tells him what to do about it. Verses 6 through 11, particularly, he tells him, here's what you need to concentrate on to overcome apostasy. Warn against it, number one. Warn against it. And then secondly, develop a robust personal holiness. In other words, he's saying the combination of exposing error and practicing truth will help avoid apostasy. Powerful antidote, it won't get rid of all of it, some of it's gonna happen, but here's a way to address it. And then in verses 12 through 16, he gives some general guidelines for church leaders. That's the big picture of this chapter. Now the key phrase is in verse six. Six, latter part of the verse, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. I think it's easy to gloss over that simple phrase, but it is one of the most powerful incentives that the Bible has. You will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. You know, in the, in, in the Bible, the, the believers are often called slaves of God or slaves of Christ. Usually in the English versions, that's translated servant, especially since the time when slavery was well known in the Western world. And so the, 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 the real emphasis of that word is missed. But often that's the word that's used. Most often that's the word that's used. But here it's, the, it's a different word. It is the word servant from Greek, the diakonos, from which we get the word deacon. Uh, when you think of a Christian as a slave, you're thinking of someone who has submitted their will to God. And so that's the emphasis when that word is seen. When you see the word servant as here, the issue is serviceability, usefulness. Usefulness to Christ. We're in his service and therefore we are proving to be useful servants. And the word good there could be translated noble or 
admirable or excellent. We are to be good, excellent, noble servants of Jesus Christ. What a privilege to do that, to be the honored servants of a great master. Isn't that wonderful, the privilege that God has given us? Every true Christian should want this. Every true Christian. You know, in the parable of the uh, talents that Jesus gave in Matthew 25, the two servants who took their talents and used them in a noble way, in a good way, were addressed by Christ at the end when he came back, when he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Remember that? What person, what true believer wouldn't want to hear that from the Lord Jesus one day? Well done. I mean, that's, that's our incentive. Is there anything? I mean, I mean isn't that better than the, 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 than the crowns and the mansions and all the other stuff, the streets of gold that we look forward to, to hear Jesus say, well done. And that's what Paul is aiming at here. He's trying to help us be those who can hear that. I would, I, I would say it this way. A true Christian who isn't really that interested in being a good servant of Jesus Christ probably isn't a true Christian. If this doesn't drive you, then something is missing in your life. John Stott says this. He says, Jesus Christ has ministers of all sorts, good, bad, and indifferent. But I cannot imagine a nobler ambition than to be a good minister of his. I can't either. This is living life with high purpose. And so in this passage, Paul is going to give us five characteristics of what a good minister looks like to help us, number one, examine our life. Are we there? Number two, what would it take for us to move a little further along that road? So the next couple of weeks, we'll look at those. First one we find is that a good servant warns against error. A good servant warns against error. It's the beginning of verse 6. He says, if you put these things before the brothers... You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. What things? Well, the things he's just talked about in verses 1 through 5. The danger of those who will apostatize by leaving the faith, departing from the faith to pursue the doctrines of demons through the insincerity of liars. And remember, those aren't going to come with a label that says warning. They're going to come looking exactly like what you think is truth and right. And so you have to be discerning to see the things that are wrong. It's a constant danger that someone's going to come along with enticing words and paint a picture of a greener pasture somewhere else. Close to, but it's not truth. That's the danger. Telling people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear and thus enticing them away from the truth of the word. A good servant of Jesus Christ must put these things before the brothers must warn against the danger of leaving the truth of God for some, half, some of the half-truths of Satan that come in the form of, you know, some really convincing manner by some seductive presenter who can spin air and make it sound like profound truth. We've all seen and heard them. And yet over time, as you get more and more into the Word, those kind of things ought to begin to resonate. Ooh, something's wrong with this, even as you begin to hear it. Happens every day and we must be warned. That's exactly what Paul did earlier in the first five verses. He warned against the enticement of asceticism. Now why would asceticism, why would you say that's enticing? Well, it's enticing because it gives people a way to do something to get right with God. And everybody wants to do something. And so Paul had warned against those who were in the church already teaching, hey, they were teaching against marriage, against sexuality in marriage, against against eating certain foods, because if you did those things, then you could be right with God. So that was the particular thing that was happening in Ephesus at that point in time. But while there is one truth, there are millions of lies that lead people away from the truth, are there not? And we need to be warned. There's the truth of the seeker-sensitive church movement in our day, developed with all good intention. Get people in, make them feel welcome, and make them feel wanted. Nothing wrong with that. We should do that. Our church should be better at that. Thank you for all of you who do, but we have to do a better job, making sure that the people who stand around alone are spoken to. 
that we are making them feel wanted. But the problem is we soon turn that into, eventually we turn that into, hey, let's find out exactly what people want. Let's do surveys. Let's go find out what they want to hear, what they want to do. And before long, beloved, we lost the message. So many churches have been compromised because they have gone down this road and they've been able to get great, great crowds of people. But the question is, how many of those people really understand the gospel? You see, it's, it's easy to see why this eventually fails. The message that we have, the truth that we represent, which is that all people are sinners, that all people are hopelessly lost and cannot be accepted by God by anything that they could ever possibly do, but that God has loved his creation enough to send his own son to die in our place to pay the price that we could not pay. And that by accepting him, that by dying to self and coming alive to him, we can have new life in Christ. That is not a message that is popular now or ever will be. And yet it's the truth. And so it's the truth that we must represent or, or why do we exist? Our desire for popularity is killing us in the church. We've adopted the world's dress code to, to a large extent. We have adopted the entertainment philosophy of the world, the manner of speaking of the world. We have, unfortunately, we're way down the road on adopting the world's moral code. And so we have the world's attitude toward premarital sex. Used to be, at least in the church, you'd know that people would be against that. Not anymore. People don't even think twice about the fact that there are people exercising their sexuality outside the boundaries that God has defined as being right and proper. Church after church has caved on the issue of homosexual relationships and same-sex marriage. It usually turns out that somebody in leadership in a church where they were standing against this for a time, somebody in leadership has somebody in their family or some friend that is in that category. And rather than helping them come to the truth of the gospel, We've caved to the human wisdom of the world around us. All this despite the clear and an unambiguous teaching of the Scripture in these areas. You cannot, you cannot go in these directions, beloved, without leaving the, leaving the truth of Scripture behind. Same is true when it comes to gender identity. And the question that we would have this morning is, where are the warning voices of the good servants of Jesus Christ? Where are they? Too often they're missing in action. Michael Horton, a theologian, writes this. He said, I think the church in America is so obsessed with being practical, relevant, helpful, successful, and perhaps even well-liked that it nearly mirrors the world. That's the kind of message that you would hear in church after church after church that you might go to this morning how to be relevant, how to be helpful, how to be successful, how to be tolerant, everything except how to be saved. This is the most important thing that there is in life. Clear back in 1966, the World Council of Churches published a directive that said this, the world must set the agenda for the church. Wow, I thought Jesus Christ was the head of the church. I thought Jesus set the agenda. I thought we have the agenda here in his word. This is one of the reasons that we're going through 1 Timothy because a lot of it's there. Where are the warning voices? Turn, turn with me to Judges chapter 1. You don't have to go far to find current culture in the Bible. I mean, I know the language is sometimes a little bit different and the uh, you know, the, the, the mores and the kind of, of uh, cultural practices were different, but the truths of what we face are the same as the truths they face. J Judges chapter 1, what is it, sixth, seventh, sixth book in the, seventh book in the Bible, I guess if I get to Judges instead of Joshua. Judges chapter 1, I'm reading in verse 4, beginning in the middle of verse 4. The, what's happened is that the Israelites are moving into the land of Canaan after they've been released 
my God for delivered from Egypt. And so they're going into the land and two tribes, Judah and Simeon, have gone in to fight the Canaanites and the Perizzites, two of the tribes that lived in the land of Canaan that God had told them to take. And so beginning in verse four in the middle, it says the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. Well, that's great. Good start, right? But look what happens in verse six. Adonai Bezak, who is the king of the Perizzites, fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Sorry, it's a little bloody here. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up the scraps under my table. As I have done, God has repaid me, so I guess I got what I deserved. Well, that all sounds great, right? God provided a victory. Even this evil king has somehow recognized that maybe he was just getting his just due. Sounds good. It's not. And let me show you why. Just turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Pass Joshua up and go to Deuteronomy. And here's what Moses had told the people just a few months before this happened. What we just read in Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 2. Moses tells the people, And when the Lord your God gives them, that is the conquered people, including the Canaanites and the Perizzites, when God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You say, wow, God is pretty harsh. Oh, beloved. Read back in Genesis 15. You'll find out God gave these people 400 years to repent. 400 years to repent. And now he realizes that if they are not destroyed, this is the day of judgment eventually comes, right? The day of judgment has come. And because the Israelites were the people of God, they were the instrument through whom this was going to be exacted. But instead they let the king live. Israel did not obey. They did not fully destroy. They eased up. They took their foot off the accelerator. And that passage we just read in the book of Judges forms a, it's kind of like a bookend at one end of the book. If you went to the end of the book of Judges, you would find out that there's been a downward spiral all the way through that book. It starts with the compromise in Judges chapter 1. And all the way through the book of Judges, the wicked people get more wicked, but the judges that God sends to help the people of God also become weaker and weaker and weaker and even more immoral as you go along. Until by the end of the book of Judges, you have an Israel that looks pretty much like the people around them. In fact, so much so, they've become so much like Sodom that God says, you are Sodom. In Isaiah Chapter 1, verse 10, Isaiah says this, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. He's talking to his own people. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Listen, the lesson, beloved, of the book of Judges is that when God's people compromise, they not only begin to become like the world around them, they tend to outdo the world around them in terms of evil. And, and I'll tell you one reason for that. The people of God somehow kind of feel like they've got an in with God. They kind of feel like God will take care of them. They kind of feel like they're forgiven. And so they can kind of do whatever they want. We're all in danger. Where are the warning voices? Here's one. I'll give you one. Here's Franklin Graham speaking on the Christian compromise regarding same-sex marriage. He says this, true followers of Christ whose salvation is based entirely upon God's word cannot endorse same-sex marriage regardless of what our president, the Congress, the Supreme Court, the media, or the latest Gallup poll says. He says, there are many things in Scripture that Christians disagree on, but the Bible is crystal clear about the sanctity of life and marriage. It is also clear that homosexuality is spelled out as sin. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. 
In the end, I would rather be on the wrong side of public opinion than on the wrong side of Almighty God who established the standard of living for the world that he created. Marriage is a biblically moral issue, not a political or theological one. That's a good servant of Jesus Christ, wouldn't you say? He's standing for the truth. It's amazing how many times churches don't warn people the dangers of false teaching, disobedience because they don't want to offend. We don't want to be offensive, beloved, but sometimes the message will offend And we have to be willing to stand for the truth of the word as opposed to the truth of the world. And there's a difference. I realize there are what we would say are great Christian people who are suddenly accepting of homosexuality. Sometimes you want to be glad to sit down and go through it with you and show you how the Bible cannot. You cannot have the Bible and have that too. Usually it's explained in terms of, well, Paul got it wrong. He He just took on the... The, the traditions of his culture, and that's what he wrote into the Scripture, but we shouldn't accept that. Great. Where else has that happened in Scripture? And where do we stop the bus? Scripture is clear on this issue, and many others like it. We, we're told that we must never be negative, always positive. Is it a good thing to be positive? Yes. Was Jesus positive? Yes. But if you read the sermons of Jesus, you'll find out he had more negative things to say than anybody else in the Bible. Why? Because he sees lost people going to hell and he wants to warn them. So he tells them the truth. Paul says if we would be good servants of Christ Jesus, we must warn of the dangers of departing from God's truth. I take it that it would be better to offend someone than not to warn them at all. Now, there's a warning for us in all of this, right? There's a warning for us. The warning for us is that we must make sure that if there is offense taken, it's taken at the truth, not at the way we have presented it. Not at a a bad attitude. So many times we're our own worst enemy with the harshness and the self-righteousness with which we speak. The word that Paul uses here when he says, put these things before the brothers, put these things, he uses a mild verb that means to kind of lay it out, to remind the people. It's, it's urging gentle persuasion, firm, but loving. It reminds me of what he says in Ephesians 4, verse 15, where he says, we must be those who speak the truth in love. Sometimes we're really willing to speak the truth, but not very lovingly. And then other times we're, not speaking the truth because we think that's the only way to be loving. We must have both. John Stott again warns, he says, some leaders are great champions of the truth and anxious to fight for it, but they display little love. Others are great advocates of love, but they have no equal commitment to truth. Truth is hard if it is not softened by love. And love is soft if it is not strengthened by the truth. And so we must work hard to make sure that both are part of how we represent the truth of the Word of God. But a good servant will do that. He will expose error. Second thing a good servant will do, he will feed on the Word. He will feed, he or she will feed on the word. This is a wonderful trait for a good servant. Paul says, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Being trained, literally the word would be nourished. So this is someone who is nourishing themselves, feeding themselves on the word. And we know what that means. If I say I was raised on, on meat and potatoes, you know what I mean, right? I am who I am physically today partly because of the way that I ate when I was younger and what I probably continue to eat. That's the nourishment that I take in. Well, we know how Timothy was nourished, right? We know that. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy. If you're in, well, get back in Timothy. 2 Timothy, just go over to chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 3.15, we know how he was 
nourished spiritually because Paul says this to him, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So Paul is saying to Timothy, you know how you, you're nourished? You know how you grew up? You grew up with the sacred writings. Where did that come from? Well, we know from earlier chapters in Timothy that this was his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois who poured the scripture into him. Timothy was well acquainted with the Old Testament. He didn't just eat to a point. He kept on eating. He kept on feeding himself. He kept on being spiritually nourished. The word that's used there, Paul says, to be continually nourished in, back in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, being nourished is a present tense word. It means you got to keep on doing this, Timothy. Being continually nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. The faith. What is that? As we saw a week or two ago, that is the Old Testament truth plus the New Testament truth that hadn't been written down yet in Timothy's time. Most of it hadn't been. Some of it was beginning to be written down. But it's the Old Testament truth plus the New Testament truth that Paul had delivered to Timothy when he found him there in Lystra and invited him to come along with him. Jude 3 speaks of this. It urges believers to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the truth of the word of God. That is to be what nourishes us. That's what we have in our Bibles. What Paul is saying is, Timothy, before you can teach anyone else, you've got to be continually, continuously feeding yourself. You must be in the word. You must be learning it. You must be understanding it. You must be putting it into practice. You can't be feeding someone else what you don't know. You know, every mother knows this, right? You can't nurse a child if you don't feed yourself. I mean, if you don't eat right or you don't eat at all, that little guy's going to let you know about it. More ways than one, right? You have to nourish yourself if you're going to nourish others. As you feed your family as a wife and mother or father, if you're a cook at the home, You first have to feed yourself, right? You can't feed others if you don't keep yourself going. So Timothy must be feeding himself, not on junk food, by the way. We'll see that next week. If you want to know what junk food is, come and we'll talk about it. But you've got to go to the Word. You've got to be nourished. Did you ever walk into a classroom and the professor, you know, pulls out his 50-year-old notes that are yellowed and crinkly on the edges, and you know, oh, no, Right? This is going to be boring, and it is. Guys haven't learned anything in the last 50 years. You're getting what he learned so long ago, he can hardly get it out. He's committing intellectual suicide, and he's taking others along with him. But a good, a good servant of Jesus Christ doesn't do that. He's not living on yesterday's food. He's nourishing himself so that he can help nourish others. No teacher of God's Word can be a good servant without being personally nourished by the Word of God. I am so thankful as I look around our church. You know, we look at teachers like Jay and Jason and Kurt and Diane and Susie and Sharon and Mary and I don't know, the other ones, the ones back in our Sunday school, I know I left people out, but people who are nourishing themselves in the Word so that they can teach others. Beloved, be thankful for those. We must be. This is the only way you can nourish someone else is if you're feeding yourself. John Stott says, behind the ministry of public teaching, there lies the discipline of private study. All the best teachers teach well because they learn well. I mean, this is so sadly lacking today. So sadly lacking. Much contemporary preaching is weak, produces weak churches because it lacks Bible Knowledge, pure and simple. You know, the pastor, to the pastor, the study is an unwelcome intrusion into his work when he'd like to be going out to lunches and socializing with people and doing some counseling or whatever it is he does except study. It produces weak people, it produces weak churches. The sermons become a text that's read to launch into some personal stories and some whatever the latest political correct trend is. 
The result of this is impotent sermons that fall on hard hearts and have little impact. Contrast this with William Tyndale. William Tyndale was one of the most brilliant linguists of his day. Early 1500s. He's the one who translated from the original language. Now, John Wycliffe, 100 years ago, had before had translated into the English version the Bible, but using, um, using uh, the Latin Vulgate, which was, which was not based on the original, not, not as well based on the original Hebrew and Greek. Tyndale was a great linguist, and by that time, they, the, 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 the scriptures had been compiled, the Greek and Hebrew scriptures had been compiled and been put together, and he went back to the original languages, and he began to translate into English, and many of the phraseologies that we still use today came from Tyndale. He was a brilliant man, translated all of the New Testament. He translated a significant portion of the Old Testament before Henry VIII caught up with him and put him to death. Brilliant man. You could say he knew the Bible, wouldn't you, from what he translated? Here's what he wrote from prison in his last imprisonment shortly before his martyrdom. He wrote to the prison keeper, and he said he was asking for, quote, a warmer cap, a warmer coat, a candle, a piece of cloth to patch my leggings, But above all, I beseech his clemency that he may kindly permit me to have my Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary that I may spend time with that in study. It's a man who's gotten a hold of this, that this is truly God's word and he wants to know what it says. Got to love people like that. Don't we want to be people like that? Two characteristics then we've seen this morning of a good servant of Jesus Christ. A good servant is wise enough to warn himself and to warn others of theological error. A bad servant cannot do that. He's not discerning enough to do that. Here's what Jesus warned the Pharisees who were the same way. The Pharisees, believe me, the Pharisees knew more Bible than you do. They knew more Bible than I do. But they had turned it into tradition. And they began to worship the tradition instead of the, instead of the real uh, teachings of the Word of God. And here's what Jesus said to them. Listen to this. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, or you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte follower, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Surely we don't want to go there. A good servant would take care not to be doing that. He's wise enough to discern the clever angel of light teachings of false teachers and then is able to warn others. In order to do that, he's got to be feeding on the Word, right? Digging ever more diligently into it so that he is nourished, finding truth to live by and then living by it. That's what a good servant of Jesus Christ does so that they can warn others away from this. Listen to what Paul said in his last imprisonment. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.13, and this is, he was, in, he was in prison when he wrote 1 Timothy. He was released for a brief period of time. And by 2 Timothy, he's back in and he's not going to get out this time. He's going to be executed. He writes this in 2 Timothy 4.13. He's asking Timothy to come. He says, everybody's deserted me. He said, please come. He said, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with you, the, the cloak that I left with Carpus in Troas, Also the books, and above all, the parchments. What are those? The books and the parchments. These are copies of Scripture along with commentaries. Now get this, beloved. Here's the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He's about to die. 
He's everything that he's ever known, he's poured out into these books of the Bible that he's written. And what is he saying? Give me more. I want to know what God has to say. I want to nourish myself on the word of God, still searching out the deep things of God. Still to the last, Paul was nourishing his soul on the truth of the word. Not long before he died, Billy Graham said this, one of my greatest regrets is that I have not studied enough. I wish I had studied more and preached less. People have pressured me into speaking to groups when I should have been studying and preparing. He went on and said, Donald Barnhouse, great preacher, pastor of the 10th Avenue Presbyterian in Philadelphia, he said, Donald Barnhouse said that if he knew the Lord was coming in three years, he would spend two of them studying and one preaching. He said, I'm trying to make it up. Well, that should tell all of us what we need to know about priority, should it not? Here's God's choicest servants saying, I need the word. Even as I'm closing out my life, even as I've learned so much through the word, through the, through the time that I've been here on this earth, I need the word. It's almost like the more you get, the more you're hungry for it. That's the truth of the matter. And that's what a good servant of Jesus Christ does. Nourishes himself in the word of God so they can teach others. Ask the team to come forward as we bow in a word of prayer. Close our service. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us today. We want to be good servants. We want to hear one day, good, well done. Good and faithful servant. We all of us, Lord, in the honesty of our own heart, we, we know how far short we fall of this. And yet we know how the blood of Jesus Christ continually, continuously cleanses us from all sin. How you look on the heart and where there is failure, if there is a heart that is seeking you, a heart that is regularly confessing this sin, moving forward, you'll see that. Paul wasn't perfect. John wasn't perfect. None of those apostles were perfect. They all heard, well done. It's not beyond our grasp. But we must take to heart the things that you tell us. Be faithful to the word because we know the word. So may that be true of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.